book of Acts, chapter 3, verses 1 to 16. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer, at three in the afternoon. Now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. While the man held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. When Peter saw this, he said to them, fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the holy and righteous one and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him, as you can all see. This is the word of the Lord. Glory to you, O Lord. Philip said, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip, even after I've been among you such a long time? Anyone who's seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it's the Father living in me who's doing his work. Believe me when I say that I'm in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I've been doing. And they'll do even greater things than these, because I'm going to the Father. And I'll do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified by the, in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. If you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate, to help you and to be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him. For he lives with you and will be in you. I'll not leave you as orphans, I'll come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. 
because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let's just pray as we stand. Father God, may all that is spoken and all that is heard bring glory to you through our lives. Amen. Please do sit down. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And he did. How should we think about that? Where do we even begin? Do you feel astonished and amazed, like the crowd gathering around Peter? I suggest we begin where Peter began as he addressed that crowd. Perhaps he also addresses us. He began with sovereignty and humility. Our humility and God's sovereignty. Why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we've made this man walk? It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him. Peter was not going to allow himself to take the credit for this miracle. It is Jesus who heals. Whether a prayer for healing works or does not work is in God's loving hands, not in ours. Even the word works is such a misconceived concept when it comes to healing. Often we have no idea what God is working in the other person's life but he knows. Whenever we exercise the gifts of the Holy Spirit, we should remember Paul's admonition that all must be done out of love. Love of God and love of our neighbor. The gifts are born in love and are to be exercised in love. And whether we're praying or being prayed for, we should always remember to place ourselves under the sovereignty of God, who is love. It's God who knows the end from the beginning. God, speaking through Isaiah's words, declared, My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. God is sovereign. Every time we say the Lord's Prayer, we commit ourselves to live under God's sovereignty. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now this is the third of our series looking at the church unleashed. And today we're looking at the church unleashed in power. So I want to try and consider the power of God at work in and through the church. And not just to focus on healing. Although that is perhaps the premier example of God's power in work, in human lives. When we open ourselves up to being channels for God's power and his love, when we commit ourselves to living for him, then we allow him to work through us in power. But we also draw the attention of the devil and so become a target for his attacks, whether directly or through others, perhaps those in positions of power and authority who feel threatened. Last week, for example, we heard how the early church was being undermined by a spirit of racism against the Hellenic widows. They were not being treated in love. And along with the spiritual gifts of power, comes the need for God's protection too, which is one very good reason for exercising power through prayer in the name of Jesus. 
Later on in Acts, Luke records that the seven sons of Sceva tried to use the name of Jesus more like a magic word as they sought to exorcise a demon-possessed man. Instead, this man thoroughly beat them up after declaring, Jesus I know, and I know about Paul, but who are you? God's power is gifted to us in love. And it's not for us to use outside of God's love. We offer ourselves in his service to use as he wills. It was Jesus who taught us that right focus of prayer. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And even Jesus himself did not use his power on his own behalf, but only to glorify the Father. As we read in our gospel, this is why he promises to gift us with power. I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. Now today I'm going to give you a number of examples from my own life, not because I'm somehow special, I'm not, but because I can bear witness to these examples of God's power. Firstly, an example from totally outside the context of healing. It's from St. Andrews on Goldsworth Park. We were struggling to fund the building of a new church, but in faith we decided to go ahead anyway. We were sure we should employ a Christian building projects manager, but we knew we couldn't afford one. The project team prayed. The next morning, there was a ring on the vicar's doorbell. Uh, I've just been put on six months garden leave, and I wondered if I could help the church. Oh, what do you do? Oh, I manage... My project managed the building of oil rigs in the North Sea. After finishing the church building, this man went on to train to be a vicar. The impact of this event on our congregation was immense. Faith became concrete, tangible. God hears. God answers. And in my second example... Healing borders on protection. This lady had a history of mental illness. Our house group prayed frequently for her, and she often made progress, only later to relapse. She was frightened because she sensed a metal band around her head with writing on it. On the way home that evening, I had a picture of that band and of the writing. And I was able to phone her and tell her that it said, Credo in unum Deum. I believe in one God. I could with confidence assure her that the band was God's band of protection over her mind. She didn't so much need our prayers for healing as for protection. And these two examples illustrate the two-way nature of faith. The first example shows, that faith, shows the faith that God hears us and will respond. And it's a very powerful form of faith. But it's one that leaves uncertainty in the air as we wait patiently for God to act. It also leaves open the question of how God will choose to act. In my first example, he prompted a stranger to ring the vicar's doorbell. And this leads to the second direction of faith. Faith that we do indeed hear God. And then the faith to act on what God prompts us to do. The project manager acted on God's prompt. And it changed his life and the lives of many in our church. Our church grew in numbers. It's also the type of faith that underpins the second example. Faith, in this case, that I'd heard right. And faith to pass on what God wanted the lady to know. 
it strengthened the faith of our house group, and our prayers for healing became more assured. We were no longer scared to have a go. And it's this second type of faith that Peter exemplifies in our reading from Acts. Luke's report, in Luke's report, Peter did not pray for the beggar to be healed. There was no petition here. Rather, he knew in faith that God had already decided to heal this man and in faith commanded the healing. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And from this, we can draw another lesson about the exercise of power in the church. It should be nothing to do with our own goals or desires. We should be very careful not to abuse the power that God gives by, for example, declaring that God's on my side in this particular debate. We need to pray, your will be done on earth in heaven, as in heaven even if it's not what we want. And when we know God's will, we can move from petition to action, fully expecting God to act through us, as he did through Peter. In fact, Peter was so confident that even though the man did not respond at first, he took him by the right hand and helped him up. And it was only then that the healing happened. Sometimes I myself have been told quite clearly by God not to pray for healing. Once it was because it was not God's will to heal. He was calling his daughter home to be with him. And I prayed instead for a peaceful and serene homecoming. The testimony in the church the following Sunday of her husband and two teenage children after being at her with, uh, as she passed away, was awe-inspiring to hear. And another time, God said quite simply that the person asking for prayer would be healed. It was a done deal, and so I should not pray for healing. It was an act of faith to desist, and a joy to declare to that person that God had already ordained his healing. It still took months of chemotherapy, but undertaken with joy and thanksgiving, rather than fear and uncertainty. This man became God's witness wherever he was treated. So God does continue to work powerfully through his people and through his church, and in this we can rejoice. But it still leaves those impossible questions. Why not me too? How come not everyone is healed? There must have been other beggars in the temple courts at that time, but God directed Peter to this single individual. It's a tough question, and it's well above my pay grade. Job struggled with this, as did his advisors. And the only answer he got was in the sovereign will of God which can be beyond our understanding. Often then our petition should be for the grace to place ourselves in God's loving care, no matter how hard that might be. To receive the grace to share in Jesus' suffering as he shares in ours. To find that place of peace beyond understanding that only he can give. And this leads to my final example. It's of a lady whose daughter was stabbed to death. And one day she shared with me that the grace she was given came through a vision, a reenactment of that stabbing. But in this vision, Jesus was standing between her daughter and the assailant. Jesus took the full force and pain of the attack. And it is because Jesus shared in and still shares in our suffering that he can promise to wipe away every tear, that a time will come when there will no longer be any pain. This lady was given 
the grace to experience Jesus' promise, despite her devastating loss. And she, too, is a great witness, bringing glory to the Father. I do wonder if that lame man is also intended to be a metaphor for the church itself. How might we leap for joy in our hearts, praising God? What might hand might lift us up? How might we experience our church unleashed in power? I'd like to suggest the following four things, which each of us can do. Firstly, choosing to have faith that God does hear us, and also to have faith that we hear him and will act on his prompts. Secondly, to choose to live in God's sovereign will, to seek what he wants and not to try and impose our will on him. Thirdly, to choose to seek God's protection as we offer ourselves to be channels of his power. And finally, to choose to encourage one another by witnessing to the power of God in and through our own lives, and so bring glory to the Father. Amen. I'm going to invite you to join me in the prayer that should be on the overhead. But please read it first as you think about the exercise of spiritual power in our church and in our lives. Then join me if you're able. We say together, Father God, today, Unleash the power of your Holy Spirit in love into our church and into my life, that our lives might bring you glory through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Lord of all blessing, you have created a beautiful world. However, there are many places where there is discord and war, disease, and due to the pandemic, shattered dreams. Help us to comfort the afflicted and restore human dignity. Help us to know ourselves blessed at every turn. Blessed in the forthcoming autumnal sun and leaves, in the rain and shafts of sunlight, in the turning of the world beneath our feet. Blessed in silence, in sleep, in our family and friends. Blessed in music, in singing voices, in the song of birds, in the touch of love, in laughter. Blessed in pain, in darkness, and grief. But Lord of all blessing, we bless you. Lord, in your mercy, Amen. we continue to pray and give thanks for the work of the NHS and associated professions. We look with eagerness to the forthcoming visit of the Archbishop of Canterbury to the diocese and to the Alpha Course, following a successful Heritage Week here at St. Nicholas. We extend our prayers to our neighbors in Amy Drive, from the electoral roll of Tina, Mike, Rita, Vicky, Sally, and Paul, to Vicky and her team leading the welcome focus in the church development plan, our social and events team, led by Pam, Val, and Ruth, in sustaining our local association with the Campaign for Christians Against Poverty. Lord, in your mercy, 
Help us, Lord, to give comfort and support to those who are facing illness. Mildred, Tony, Alice, Valerie, Tim, and others known to us. Our prayers are with the families and friends of those who have passed away. Brian, Joan, Liz, May. Father, into your house and gate of heaven, where there is no darkness but one equal light, one equal music, no fears or hopes, no ends nor beginnings, but one equal eternity. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. To conclude our prayers, a mild adaptation of the words of the great Gallic blessing. Aye, indeed so. Deep peace of the running wave to you, Deep peace of the flowing air to you. Deep peace of the quiet earth to you. Deep peace of the shining stars to you. Deep peace of the gentle night to you. Moon and stars pour their healing light on you. Deep peace of Christ, the light of the world to you. Merciful Father, Accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.